Stephen uh, has been doing a column from issue one of the magazine and in the last issue, so it's looking at uh, the incredible collections at Letterform Archive. They have over 100,000 uh, objects in the collection which trace the history of uh, graphic design, typography, lettering, um, and so on. And uh, it's a brilliant column, and it literally just scratches the surface of what the archive has to offer. Uh, the one in issue three was about um, Ross F. George, who was the inventor of the speedball pen and the textbook that was used to market it, uh, which I think many of you will know and has been hugely influential uh, in sign painting and much further afield. Uh, Kel has been instrumental in uh, working with that collection uh, on behalf of the archive, and it's really exciting to have uh, both him and Stephen here today uh, to, to share some of the collection, and I believe uh, a number of items that have never been uh, been shared online before, so I'm, I'm extremely excited, and, uh, and thank you both for joining. So I'm going to take my video off and, uh, and let you lead the session. Thank you so much, Sam. Uh, I'm one of those people that actually would be all for a Bob Fest. I think uh, it's hard to follow that up. Uh, it was so wonderful. Thank you, Bob. Um, before we get started, I just want to embarrass Sam a little bit and say that I'm so impressed with what he's doing with Better Letters, with Blag. Um, you know, at a time when a lot of print publications are either, uh, you know, getting smaller or dying out, um, especially in the design fields. It's just so um, amazing to have something of this caliber being produced and actually getting larger and uh, being done without any uh, advertising. Uh, I'm just floored by that. And I think, you know, a lot of that, as Sam said, goes to this community and how involved they are. But it also just, you know, it couldn't be done unless the person who's doing it really cares. And I think that's uh, apparent with what Sam does with these events and with uh, with the magazine and with their letters. So, Sam, thank you for all that you do. It's really, really great stuff. Well, th thank you. It only, it only happens because of the uh, of the people around it. Um, you know, I've got to somehow drive it, but uh, um, but uh, you know, without yourself and and everybody that supports it through contributions, subscribing, and sponsoring, and the rest of it, it doesn't happen. So uh, it's it's an honor to do so. All right. So I'm going to share screen uh, as soon as I'm given permission to do so, and I'll introduce. Um, both uh, uh, the archive and myself, and then Kill introduce himself, and then we'll get right into a bunch of great Ross F. George stuff. You should be good to go. Yes. Okay. Um, so as Sam said, Letter from Archive is a nonprofit library museum. We're in San Francisco, and we have a collection that's really focused on typography, lettering, graphic design, uh, uh, calligraphy, anything that involves interesting letter forms. And because of that focus, we've had people come from all over the world to visit us. And we we really take uh, this um, stewardship of this collection seriously and, and want to share it as much as we can. Um, and so one of the things that you'll get uh, when you uh, schedule a tour or research visit is the access, hands-on access, if you're in San Francisco, or virtual access through an online visit um, to a really broad uh, collection of materials. That could be everything from medieval manuscripts and a leaf of the Gutenberg Bible to uh, speedball uh, material. You see a textbook and uh, pens right there on the table. Um, and then we also do very... Um, uh, themed or uh, custom tours for specific groups and classes. This is a table I set recently for the Neon Speaks conference that happened uh, here in San Francisco a few weeks ago. So uh, pulled just things that would be of interest to people who love science and sign making. And we also publish books about the collection. And I think you saw in the slideshow uh, that Sam was just presenting earlier that uh, there is a book that we've just released on the Vienna Secession and the incredible art and lettering of that era, which is really underappreciated. It's kind of this period right after Art Nouveau that was 
um, this just explosion of interesting new work, especially in letter form. So the uh, the book is called Die Fleche, and it is about this periodical from 1902 to 1911, and you can check it out on our site. So that's the end of kind of the uh, sales pitch. Uh, but I'll add one more thing is that we do exhibitions and um, it's great that Kel's with me here because uh, he was a co-curator of this show, which is on graffiti zines of the 90s. It's in our gallery now and will be till the end of the year. Um, and it is a great, as we've been talking about in the chat earlier, this it's this great opportunity to uh, combine communities of uh, you know different disciplines that often do overlap quite a bit, but often don't have a space in which they're uh, given room to overlap in community. And we're really, this show is very uh, fun, very interesting. Um, it's co-curated by our uh, librarian, Kate Long Steller, and, um, and a couple of great um, uh, graffiti writers, uh, Greg LaMarche and uh, David Villarenti. So, please uh, check out that online or come visit us. And uh, that's the end of my little intro. Uh, Kel, tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, this slide uh, is showcasing my new type foundry. Um, I am a type designer, lettering artist, uh, but also I've just been a person who hangs around Letterform Archive for a really long time. Um, and so what that meant, especially in the beginning, was that I had found some rad place that had all of these amazing things that I could uh, go and look at. I'm a collecty person myself, and that's a big part of uh, the lettering and the uh, graffiti writing work that I've always been interested in and involved in. Um, but finding the archive was this big thing for like this place that had everything I was excited about. And the first, and I found out I could volunteer there, signed up immediately, and um, Luckily, had uh, worked with some people that kind of knew what I was about pretty early on. And so the first thing that they actually assigned of me was to take every piece, uh, everything that's come in from the family of Ross George and catalog it and uh, find the things that are important to scan and put online and write as much as you can about them. But um, I did that for the first few months of being around the archive, and it was super special. And it's really fun to get to open this the boxes back up and talk about this stuff now yeah uh so go uh check out kel's uh foundry overlap type and uh you can see some of these awesome typefaces they've released recently uh so uh actually in the chat if if people would please if you've worked with uh, speedball pens or use it you know regularly in your work please um say so in the chat because i'm 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 not a practicing lettering artist i'm not a type designer i'm just a you know, a silly critic. Uh, and so it's not something I've used myself, but I have, you know, spent a lot of time with the collection and, um, but I'd love to know who is using them on the regular. Um, what we have at the archive is the um, archive from Ross F. George's family, thanks to uh, his granddaughter and kind of the shepherding of Randall Hassan, who uh, is one of the editors of the later editions of the Speedball textbook. And so what we're doing is just kind of digging into what we have in the collection and telling you a little bit more about who Ross F. George was, what makes this um, work so interesting. I'm showing this first because uh, it gives you a sense of what the, the marketing goal was with, with Speedball. It was a invention that, um, that uh, George came up with when he... Uh, had dropped a pen on the floor and it bent the tip. And uh, as he started experimenting with this now broken pen, he started realizing that that offered uh, some, you know, you know, flexibility and some, uh, you know, adding a reservoir would make the the pen become a much better tool for, you know, doing a lot of lettering in a short period of time. And so that's where the name comes from. That initial. Uh, um, uh, nib was called the A, and it was a square rectangular nib. So that's what you see illustrated here. It was in 1915 when it was finally patented uh, by the the Hunt Company, which is who they had uh, uh, George and his partner uh, William Gordon had sent it to. Um, and this is the ninth edition of the the Speedball textbook, along with uh, some lettering sets and nibs. Um, 
And one of the amazing things about having access to this archive is that we see some of those original prototypes that um, Ross F. George was was working on. So they're they're very hand wrought. They're just using you know bits and pieces of other pens and and metal and um, and it's it, what you see here on the left is that uh, you know a, a large size of that a B. Uh, nib that came later, which is is often what people think of when they think of speedball is that round nib. Uh, but there's a, a couple of other um, experiments here too for later uh, nibs. And then we also have the rest of his own pen collection. So uh, we made a special box that that, that houses these and um, you know some of these are other prototypes um, and some are his you know, own invention, his own final releases of the speedball pen, and some are from other companies. And there's about uh, four drawers of these. We get a sense of, of what he was using and what he kept in his collection. Also is a collection of some original nib uh, boxes, and these are really fun. I really enjoy um, the lettering on these packaging, you know, some of the work was done by uh, Gordon, but a, a lot of it was done by George. So maybe, maybe you can tell Cal the difference between their styles. But um, I think this is probably George. Yeah, I think it's George too. And there's a later one, and then you see uh, kind of a more of a modern. You know, it's cool to see that one at the bottom uh, after showing Di Flecha because that is very inspired by. Uh, that turn of the century uh, Vienna secession style uh, that kind of spread over across the pond to the U.S. Um, this 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 Gothic uh, uh, style of of sans serif there. So one of the brilliant things about the the whole product is that it became super popular partially just through education through marketing it with a textbook, with a, a way of learning how to letter uh, that um, helped, you know, lots and lots of new uh, people enter the field. Uh, other thing I forgot to mention about the pen is it was a it was also really successful because at the time uh, show cards as a as a you know a, a format were becoming more popular there at the turn of the century. You know, a lot of show cards were were being done with brush. Um, and the idea with the pen is that you could be doing it much quicker for those small uh, size jobs. And um, so that's one reason there was this just explosion of interest in the pen. Uh, but also they were really brilliant in marketing it with these guidebooks. So this is the first um, uh, edition. It wasn't called the Speedball Textbook initially. This, this was uh, Gordon's design. Uh, it was called the Comprehensive Textbook of Modern Pen and Lettering. That was in 1915. This is now then to the 10th edition, and um, you see it's called the Speedball Textbook after the after the 8th edition. And it was just full of really great educational material. So there's, there's salesmanship in here, as we'll see, but there's also um, just what became the guide that, uh, especially in the U.S., people learned to letter from initially. And we're going to kind of go through some pages really quickly. Uh, I'll pause on a couple of things. And Kel, you just tell me to stop whenever you want to say something. But this here is a really great illustration of um, just getting a sense of how this bent nib worked, how you would hold it, um, a little bit of a scene of what, what it would have looked like at the time for a sign maker. The other thing that helped people learn is that, you know, with that B nib, you had no contrast to worry about. So it was a way for people to get started uh, with uh, doing letters where they only were thinking about structure and spacing and, um, you know, proportion rather than having to worry about where the thicks and the thins go. Although there were, of course, other uh, pen nibs that allowed that. There's a uh, instruction about layouts on show cards. You know, primarily these pens were meant for show cards. This was a period when, um, you know, shops uh, had started to have a little bit of window signage, but it wouldn't be temporary. And so the way to advertise something is to put a, a painted card in the window. And 
and you start to see uh, at in these books the kind of styles that were popular at the time. And it's so fascinating for me as a historian to look back at things that were hand lettered and then see kind of the DNA of it, where a lot of these lettering styles came from were these alphabets and instruction manuals. You can see here some of George's own uh, show cards, I believe, here on the right. Yeah. And also, like his work. yeah. And in um, this one, uh, somebody actually had their own. Um, I don't think this was, I'm not sure if this was uh, George's own copy uh, or just one we had in the archive, but somebody's um, demonstrating their own handiwork in the, with the B nib. Yeah, you see some pencil drawings in a few of these booklets too of uh, whoever owned it trying out a couple of the, the ideas. And then sometimes you just, they, they toss in some uh, typefaces. So on the right here are actually two uh, typefaces as kind of um, models to work with. Really funky uh, Roman over there on the left. Well, yeah, a lot of this, a lot of this stuff is kind of like Samuel Wello work, at least in the the early days. I think maybe maybe based based on the time period, but Samuel Wello, another um, super fun uh, show card writer from that time. So uh, on this one, I wanted to show you one of the great, um, you know, blessings of having the original artwork in the archive. So on the left here, you see this classic Roman. You see, um, you know, I assume George uh, having his hand at the, the classical Roman inscriptional lettering. Um, and what we know, uh, thanks to the original artwork, is that this was not the original design for this. So here is an, a piece of original uh, well, it's actually a, a, a print, perhaps a, some sort of uh, a photographically reduced or produced print. Uh, but then we see some adjustments made to it. So this is, you know, including some pen and some whiteout. You see that the B, I'm just going to flip between the two, the little uh, stroke in the B has been straightened out. Don't know if that's an improvement or just a different style. Uh, you also see that the angle of the stress uh, with the grid there is emphasized on the C and the D, which is a, a useful thing for people who are learning. And then on the ampersand, you see a little pencil sketch, like maybe we can get this uh, a little more flair into this ampersand. These are where we, they start to get really interesting. There's a lot of style and flair put into these. I love the Western letters. And you'll see uh, later in a, another edition how this kind of style was brought to the cover of the textbook. There you see Gordon Tech. So assumingly that was from uh, William Hugh Gordon. And then of course, with the other nibs, you could do also uh, more traditional kind of copper, copper plate or round hand uh, scripts. You see the, the stroke instructions here and some more uh, really fun show card examples. Movie titles. This is a, a, a great one that I'm glad it's in this book because uh, those who love silent film will know that a lot of silent film title cards, those inter, -car, uh, inter titles between, you know, that, that give the dialogue are hand lettered cards. And uh, the speedball pen was a huge ingredient in making those uh, as it gained popularity into the 20s and 30s. an ad uh, about that time. Really fun. Uh, it's almost an, an upright uh, italic, but it's really, it's a Roman with just a lot of life. And then this is the back of cover of that book that we just looked at. <laughs> really great script with the, the B-nib. So here's uh, now the 11th edition, and now you can see that kind of Western style. This is unfortunately one issue that we don't have in the um, in the archive. So thanks to Nick Sherman for this photo. Um, and I love that that speedball textbook, and it's got that kind of jagged uh, style that we saw in the Western alphabet. No curves, as far as I can tell, in that just all straight line. And then they use that same uh, kind of artwork for a uh, a pen kit. So this is actually the top of a box. Um, it's for sale right now for $150 at Miss Man, if you want to go pick it up. 
uh, but a beautiful uh, extension of that logo with the number two beginner's outfit. This is one of my favorite covers, uh, both front and back uh, for the 14th edition. This one's actually signed by George there in the bottom left. And I, yeah, I love that back cover design with the uh, outlined black letter and a really interesting uh, kind of double line Gothic there. 15th and 16th edition. So as they went along, each cover would be uh, would be different. And you can see in these books kind of the progression of style, um, you know, as they started to update them for whatever kinds of styles were popular at that particular time. Uh, I want to show this to, to give you a sense of the exercises that they were showing, the muscle memory you talked about earlier that you learn as you first start to make letters. Stroke diagrams. Yeah, a lot more stroke diagrams over time. I think that's that's part of the thing in the if you look through this series is once you get to this different format, that's a little more like classic scene format for us these days. Um, they've really done a uh, he's done a ton of work to add in the pen and where you might flick and turn the pen to to create these different strokes. There's way more information in the later ones, I guess. Is what I'm saying. And, you know, some of these were then just reproduced as single sheets and very, you know, people would teach with them. And uh, if they included the pen, you know, use the C0 nib here, then uh, it became this ongoing advertisement for the company. Some of them start to get really ornamental. Uh, they wanted to show that you could do things more than just your 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 simple monoline script. You could add some decoration. And again, another, I think. Oh, so go ahead. I was just going to say that another thing that happens in the in these later kind of issues of the textbook is that you'll see a lot of things like the tail on on a cue in a lot of these alphabets where he gives you two or three versions of what you can do. And so hopefully there'll be some examples of that, but that's another thing that kind of gets added in over time, the more detail work happens. Another thing you'll notice is a lot of nature scenes in his uh, illustrations, and we'll get to why that might be later on. <laughs> this one on the right was um, either, you know, it's kind of probably a style that was popular at the time, but it, uh, like many of these alphabets, has been um, digitized as typefaces or actually converted even phototype era to typefaces. Um, and so you, you may recognize some of these things as fonts, even though they didn't initially begin that way. That personality script is kind of the uh, like the Western, but with uh, as a, as a script. Lots of really fun stuff going on here. I think this is the one you shared on your Instagram uh, or something yeah. similar. Yeah, there's some there's some work to to make texturing too that was that will kind of like differentiate the strokes that I always I like a lot in these later books. Um, he also used a I think an atomizer or something to to create the kind of like speckly white flake uh, things to show not full coverage on strokes. Mm -hmm. Although in some of the original artwork we have, you can see him making even very just Tiny using white, doing just yeah. lots of dots to make. <laughs> Right. Uh, there was a question about uh, from Valentina about what year. So this particular one is probably from the early 30s. Yeah. Oh, you can see, like, 1958. Style. 58? That one says uh, the cut in display says uh, 1958. Oh, yeah. Okay, much but... later. Yeah. But uh, many of the many of the other alphabets here would have been used for 20 years in the different uh, versions of the book. So it's possible that um, some of that stuff was 20s, 30s, and then other things were updated. Some more instruction here on spacing. And then uh, at the ends of the books, kind of like at the ends of, of type specimens, there are ornaments and borders and uh, little illustrational motifs that you could do with the pens. Some more layouts here. 
And then here you see again, another nature scene. And I love this um, demonstration of what you can do with the pen. It's almost like different uh, halftone techniques with printing, but it's it's all you know handwork. And then on the right, you see kind of recurring um, signature from George, these uh, little stick figures. Later editions of the of the book, we're not going to look at interiors, but just so you get a sense of like how styles changed. I mean, the the textbook really reflected um, the styles of the day as they as they were released. So these are getting into the sixties, nineteen sixty on the left, and I think sixty five on the right or around then. And then you want to say something about this one, Kel? <laughs> um, yeah, this is part of the bootleg thing, as from what I what I recall, I believe. Uh... This was found in Mexico City, and it's yeah. This is this is kind of um, something I found a lot when I was living down there, where um, you would find lettering and alphabet uh, books at tattoo shops, graffiti shops, art stores, things like that. But it was all photocopies from various books uh, put together in these other little books. And you can see on the very top there, bulletin. That's definitely a Ross George alphabet from the thirties. Uh, and the stuff on the bottom is also Ross George. Everything in blue is is uh, likely a Ross George alphabet. There are also copy books. So these were, um, you know, books of various sizes that you could use, if, uh, you know, for your own practice or were distributed in, in classes. Uh, and then this is the original artwork uh, for those. So again, you can start to see some of the corrections and white out and changes he's made. Uh, before it got photographically reproduced to make a plate and then print in the books. You know, to see the grid here on an angled for doing it in italic. Love this little illustration of the S stroke. We were talking earlier today about making S's uh, and the difficulty with that. So that's what they're demonstrating there. So one of the other amazing things about having a, the, the archive is that we can start to learn a little bit more about the person behind uh, this work, uh, behind the, the pen. Um, and so we're really blessed to have from his family some scrapbooks, some albums. Uh, this is uh, Ross F. George himself, handsome fellow. And up as far as down. as far as I had seen this this particular um, photo album is from the 1910, so it's probably 1911 to 1917, and it's a it's a mixed bag. It's a lot of family stuff mixed with some show cards that have never been seen or maybe never got kept, and so there's a small photograph of them. Uh, we know he had a dark room and was a photographer too. You want to jump back in? Sorry, I didn't mean to cut into no, your... keep going. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so, uh, yeah, there's uh, plenty of stuff about his family and his wife, um, and then there's a whole bunch of outdoors, uh, uh, outdoors things, too, that we're going to get to in a sec. And I love about these is that, you know, like anyone at the time was, who had these albums, there would be notes, you know, labels about where the photos were taken, who's in the photos, but when it's Ross F. George, you get some really fun lettering, you know. And then some photos from later on in his life, working mm -hmm. on, some, I think that board on the right, we actually may have, I'm not sure. Now we yeah, get to some of these uh, uh, albums, some photos of um, George and Gordon's shop itself. And I think, you know, this is labeled Jack, it may be an apprentice or a, one of the workers in the shop. Yeah. So as far as I was reading, uh, it was, I think Ross George had been kind of apprenticing under Gordon and learning uh, the sign craft from Gordon. But when by the time he got around to having his own shop, I believe that was with William Hill, which was kind of his partner. And I believe maybe both of them had been working under Gordon. But uh, in the, the around 19, sometime after 1910, uh, they opened their first kind of show card and little sign shop in Seattle. Um, at one point, they were a large enough operation that they had two sign shops. And then there's some documentation in these uh, photo albums and stuff about when they had to consolidate back to one big sign shop. And uh, one of the things that uh, Stephen and I talk about a lot when we are talking about Ross George or how to showcase him is really to 
be able to highlight these couple photos of the interiors of these sign shops because there's so much cool stuff on the wall and essentially almost none of it is anything either of us have ever seen before. And so though these are already really small photo photo prints, the more we can zoom in, the, the more great show cards you get to see from Ross George that likely disappeared. Yeah, and I, I, I wish I had taken, uh, I didn't, we'll have to do some high resolution scans. Uh, I just have some snapshots here, so I did my best, but uh, you're going to see a few things. This is 1914, as it says. Yeah, shop two. <laughs> yeah, and I think on the left, uh, I think he's in the vest there on the left, a uh, second one in. Yeah. And I think you have a zoom in on that patterns and fabrics on the wall on the yeah, background. so we have a second photo here without the the group, uh, and then this is in uh, again in the album. It's called the Green Building Shop, mm -hmm. and I'm just going to zoom in on a few different points in there. I know it's probably not the best resolution, but it's really great to see some of the flair in his work. If you if you go back one, uh, Stephen, uh, yeah, the up in the top left corner too, I believe. The address is there <laughs> in Seattle. It's Main 5107. I believe that's a show card or a small sign for their address at that shop. So, Yeah, and we'll get to that one in a second. I think it's also oh, yeah. got a lot of brush, which is great. Yeah. Oh, eight. And that's really it. blurry, but we'll, we'll, we'll do our best to get some better images out there. There are some other really fun albums in here. Uh, as I said before, he was uh, an outdoors person, loved to hike, loved to go on these adventures, and even made this album of photos uh, of, of a group that he was with um, and and made it into, you know, almost like a professional piece of work here. Yeah, and actually, I don't know that there's photo, there's slides in here to show, but uh, the the last page of this booklet is uh, an order form, I believe, to show his friends that are in these albums that they could order any of these photos reprinted, and he would make them for them. Uh, but yeah, it's got all of his sort of amazing pen lettering work. Uh, not all of it's perfect, which is kind of nice to see in some ways too. That he's not like touching these up to a to a really uh, perfected degree, but he's just doing some writing. Um, yeah, there's so many fun things about this. Oh yeah, in the back. <laughs> um, but this group, the he was part of the the Northwest Mountaineering Club, something like that. Um, and from all of these photos, and I guess by mountaineering, uh, that's that's in the sort of in the term of the day that I think that just would have been a hiking and camping group. That's not like a rock climbing thing necessarily or anything, but um, there's many photos of him going on a camping trip with maybe 40 or 50 people and, uh, and staying out for a week somewhere in the woods. I wanted to zoom in on this just because I love this yeah. bit of lettering here, the, the flare on that lowercase G and N up in garden. And um, again, that kind of jagged style with the Yuletide greetings. Mm -hmm. And another thing we have uh, a pile of at the archive is just uh, his yearly holiday card. And so if you're if you come to the archive to check this stuff out, there's there's a lot of years of uh, pretty amazing holiday cards with his photography and his lettering over the top of them. And I love these airbrushed backgrounds. You can see the stencil he's using for the M and then um, just making this beautiful frame for the photos. I mean, you can see the, the the poor women had to wear these big floofy dresses <laughs> to hike in, and yet they were they were seemed they're going to some wilderness areas. You can see he's just relishing any time he comes to lowercase g. <laughs>
I was curious about this, whether it was a uh, a boat. It seems like they're on a boat. Yeah, that would, that there, there are there are a bunch of photos of them out uh, on different and there's like they're labeled with the strait that they're sailing through or something. So I think I think at some point he had a boat or or uh, his group of friends did. They made but it, it seems so like. Was that in Alaska? Maybe that's going all the way up there. I don't know. Yeah, it could be, but it seems like they traveled a lot and their their group is really large. I think they're they're camping and hiking group. Yeah, is at least 40 or 50 people because they're in they're all labeled. There's names for everybody in there. It's yeah, it's very cute. Very endearing. So another endearing thing about uh George, which I just learned, you know, going through the archive, uh, I is this book. article in the the Hunt Pen Company's newsletter about George and his friend going across country in a Model T Ford. <laughs> I love had, this so much. <laughs> Go ahead. Designed the 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 Ford so that they could sleep in it. They like had made new new chairs so they could recline and sleep, uh, and and took off the dashboard so they could stretch <laughs> stretch out. <laughs> yeah, there's some there's some talk I think in this article or maybe one other clipping that that the family had where he had built a desk off of the back as well so it was something he could like flap down and they had pulled some chairs out and could like do some work or hang out and uh maybe as a table or something but it was supposedly one of the first modified model t's or like the the first to do this sort of like off-road camping in your car kind of move uh to drive right. across the country a pioneer in overlanding as they call it now yeah yeah exactly and life so these are some um, examples of his his uh, letterhead. Um, I just love his style. And he had so many different styles, as you can see going through here. He did a lot of different things over his career that you wouldn't always immediately recognize that it was his, but he always had life in it. And that's the thing that I kind of draw from what he did. It, it was rarely perfect. It was rarely um, really super refined, but it was always lively. more of this airbrushing. Mm -hmm. Love how the uh, pen is creating the period here. And the... This is just a, a great little treasure, a, a case of uh, compass uh, tools. And then this <laughs> book, <laughs> I, I apologize, I have too many photos, so I'm going to go through them quickly, but it's not autographs. This is a book of a single kind of motif, the word queen with the Q as a figure. And my question is, maybe you figured it out, Kel, but is this his wife, his daughter, his mother? I think that these are all loose sketches for a job and he had this plan but needed but did the whole job my my thought because they get more and more refined per page it it sort of feels like a lettering practice for a, for a job that you want the cue to work with the queen's head somehow and so over time you're going to figure out one that works <laughs> <All right. laughs> maybe Betty boop there over the right he's trying yeah. every maybe more cartoon or more realistic and then <laughs> the swoosh going off of the chin and yeah there's no explanation we don't we don't have the answer for what this was for <laughs> and a few other things randomly based in him <laughs> one reason i wondered if it was for somebody he knew is there's the, later on there's this oh you'll see it in this next one your boy loves you with pen oh. nibs <laughs> I don't yeah know, it's just extra that he had made maybe for his wife but he threw that in there yeah <laughs> this queen isn't sure You see him just using um, uh, hotel stationery. So whenever he's traveling, he's sketching. Sorry, I, <laughs> I put a lot of these in here. I just love this book. <laughs> and there's some fold out. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, this one, if anybody has used a Leroy uh, templating uh, set where you have a template and then it can make skewed or enlarged letters, you know, kind of like a mini pantograph, that's what that this reminds me of. I'm not sure exactly if it was a Speedball product, but it's suggesting you use a Speedball pen with it. Definitely something for lettering. Yeah. Oh, and then yeah. as we get to the back of these uh, albums, or actually throughout them, there are just pasted in uh, show cards. And most of these are, I think, uh, you know, photographs of show cards, because they're very small. This book is about, oh, five by three inches. And then there are tiny, tiny <laughs> little uh, photographs. I think these are actually cut. You can see them cut kind of at a, a not a square uh, angle and I think they're they're cut out from larger photos so yeah I actually of... I I had some I showed someone this a couple of days ago at the archive and they said oh that's probably from a contact sheet and then I realized that would make sense that's why they'd be this small that they would be printed this small because they're from a contact sheet but they're so great so this is the kind of thing in 1915 you would see in a window next to a display of hats So just, you know, threw in some more of his great little lettering around some of uh, his, you know, uh, his photography and travels. A couple of other, I don't know what the wholesome, what kind of product <laughs> this is <laughs> down here, but I'd love to know. This reminds me a lot of um, the, you know, earlier today, uh, we're, the, the fellow, I'm sorry, I've forgotten his name, who was talking about seaside um, uh, typography of, uh, you know, seaside England uh, and showed a broadside of, of letterpress printed broadside using wood type. This is what that you know, reminds me of this uh, style here and you can see that kind of progression from late 19th century to early uh, 20th century style using all these different lettering styles in one ad. It was not about like <laughs> uh, the clarity of message here. It was about just filling the flash. page with some good flash. Yeah, here's Hill and George. So this is talking about, uh, and I, I like I, when looking through all this stuff, finding there's lantern slides and Kodak work is really helpful to know that like, okay, this, the reason he's probably doing photography too, is because this is part of his lettering practice or what, how he can sell this work kind of thing. So at least that's, you know, trying to connect these dots, not that they're written down specifically. No, good point. Now that looks like brushwork to me. Mm-hmm. But it says work done with the first speedball pen, so that may be the um, just the uh, just the, the names there text. at the bottom half. Yeah. And mm -hmm. this is a pretty amazing piece of um, you know artifact. If you think back to his you know inventing the pen by you know this this happenstance thing of the uh, falling to the ground, and this is the first one, first piece that he made with what he calls the speedball pen. And there's. There's a interview with him in the 40s kind of talk that that's a clipping that the family also kept that um, talks a lot about how they were very concerned as show card writers that everything was about speed. And like if they and I know I think uh, a lot of the older sign painters are probably really comfortable and know and feel very confident about the same thing, but just being able to do this stuff that fast really changed the amount of money you could make in those projects. And so all of these pens and all of this work is kind of like, I, I like thinking about how stylized these folks were making these show cards, but also thinking about how can I knock this out the fastest possible way? I think it's kind of interesting in the middle of that. Love this one. <laughs> Some of these show cards are show cards about show cards, which is some of my favorite. <laughs> That's the best genre, in my my opinion. So yeah. it's kind of like how the Academy Awards always gives the award to whatever movie is about movies. You just <laughs> right. love whatever right. here is self-referential. <laughs> yeah. This slogan very often. 
<laughs> yeah, these are so good. Have you ever seen an F crossbar like that? <laughs> <laughs> a little wild. The More flowers fun. are great, though. Mm -hmm. And then here's just a collage. And I think this may be a photo of the wall in mm -hmm. the studio. Yeah, because there's the main 8107 in a decent lighting. Also in the archive are, are books like these that give us a sense of what kind of business was going on with Speedball and his own personal business. Here, yeah. I you know, this must have been um, some lettering work for Capital Music. So whether that was for uh, advertising or record labels. And some of the things, the couple strange little facts that came out of this record book, um, I don't think we have necessarily the photographs of the exact thing, but um, we know through looking at all of these that he was very involved in his church. I believe it was called Plymouth something. It's in Seattle. Um, he uh, was on the basketball team of that church. He also donated a lot to the basketball team and to sports that were happening through that church. Um, he also was pretty, <laughs> he donated quite a bit of money for the time uh, to the prohibition of alcohol that was like something he was also seemingly uh passionate about um and yeah it's just been it's really kind of fun looking through his books at at the time also uh being able to see his show car, his shop and see the photographs of these other people working in his shop on signs and then seeing in these books you know the name jack comes up a lot and he's paid out jack for monthly work or something but prior to that stuff, it's not that there, we wouldn't necessarily know that this Jack person existed and that they may have done some of these show cards that we're gawking over now. It is also showing him being paid by the Hunt Pen Company, um, Signs of the Times. Maybe was he doing a column in Signs of the Times? As I thought, this is for advertising, but it's actually for he's being re no, he's receiving funds. Yeah. So finally, we're going to end here before we give you a little overview of the online archive and what you can see on your own on our website. Um, some um, images of his, you know, color images of his uh, show cards. This is a very odd one. It's like it looks like a draft to me, but uh, it's a really unusual style done with the uh, A pen where that you can get a sense here what that A pen could do with these just very bold, uh, flat edged lines yeah and you get another thing is you just having getting to see these actual objects you get to know that all of the colors that were actually in use uh when they were going as show cards in the windows or in shops and so it's pretty fun to watch like the kind of texturing and the um you know some of this was coming from a I i believe you could get a wood colored wood print on the show card and then you could draw over that and so a lot of other tricks for texturing and fun stuff. Some of these may not be final. Some of them were to demonstrate speedball, but some may be for his own client work. That is just a really fascinating one there, that, that kind of little explosions between the letters. <laughs> yeah. They're outlining too. It's great. Love this background. Why? Because it's cool. And then here's a background before they even had any uh, any lettering on it. A little bit of lettering for the Bon Marché. And then finally, some uh, Christmas greetings, as uh, Kel promised before. Really <laughs> nice uh, nib lettering there. <laughs> he was a big fan of uh, Black Letter, too. I had a lot of those in the textbooks. So, uh, this is the last slide, but we have a little demo to show you um, of what you can see in the 
online archive. And I think we'll have just, a, I don't know, I think we start a little late, but if we have a few minutes for questions, um, I can answer that while we, while we show you. Um, so feel free to field any of those, Sam. Um, don't worry too much, Stephen. I've I've been in touch with uh, Chris, who's up next, and uh, he he's not in any particular hurry. So um, so I think you know, let's uh, let's take the time we need. There is um, uh, a sort of a technical question from uh, Fernando, who's asking that the the B nib round and D nib oval lettering styles, specifically the Metropolitan poster style shown in the manuals, are very close to the Cooper black feel called Chicago poster style. Um, do you think one thing possibly influenced the other? So do you think Ross was an influence on Cooper Black or perhaps the other way around? Um, he's saying first Cooper Black showings look to be from around 1918, 19, perhaps 20. So do, do, connections there between um, the speedball pens and, uh, and the Cooper Black style. Is that something you've uh, heard about discussed come across i i can start yeah. that one a little yeah, bit too and then and then i just uh, happen to have a, the first specimen yeah. of super black we can show while you talk <laughs> <laughs> nice um yeah i was just going to say that the the style i've been as i've been reading some of the other show card writers from the time it seems like there was an era where this style i mean cooper black the typeface did come out in uh in the late teens it sounds like and became really popular in the 20s, 30s, maybe closer to the 30s. Um, but the as a lettering style, it was it was going really strong. So essentially, just like in the type design world or the metal type world, um, every foundry sort of, once there was a popular style, every foundry kind of like made their own version of that typeface and they put that out. Similarly, uh, these lettering artists and these show card writers and side painters were learning what was kind of like leaning into whatever was the popular style of the day and creating their own version. So as I was saying before, Samuel Wello, W-E-L-O, he had a bunch of really amazing versions of Cooper. Um, there was actually a different Cooper, F.G. Cooper, that was a sign writer in Chicago. He had a style of Cooper that, and he was a popular enough uh, sign writer, show card writer that uh, when the typeface Cooper came out and it wasn't from him, people were very, uh, confused and thought that that typeface would have been associated with this FG Cooper, who is another lettering artist. So uh, that's all I was going to say. It's just that there was a lot of people doing a similar style once it got popular. Absolutely. And we're lucky to have a bunch of FG Cooper's work as well. So that could be another mm -hmm. talk uh, because it's super interesting and has a lot of so overlap good. with mm -hmm. uh, George. So uh, I just want to show you that Anybody can view uh, a lot of this work at high resolution on our website. So if you go to, uh, in fact, I'll just give you a direct link to this search, but um, this is some of the work that we have from George in the online archive. And so we can go to one of these in a better color than what I was showing you, one of these show cards and zoom in a little bit and uh, get a sense of the texture on the on the board, we try to photograph things rather than scan them. So that means that you've got light coming from one source. And so you can really get to see a little bit more of the texture of the surface, the, the shadow of the, of the paint or the ink on the surface. And so that we can you know, really reproduce these as close to the real thing as possible. Yeah. These, uh, again, are original pieces of artwork for the textbook. So these would have been, uh, at, all this white here is um, is white out uh, or, you know, using white ink with a speedball or whatever brush or pen. And then, uh, and then the rest is in black. And then that would have been photographically reproduced, uh, usually smaller to refine it uh, for the, the textbooks. It's kind of in the Cooper wheelhouse as well, a little bit. Yeah, softened, softened a little bit. And I wanted to show you this to give you a sense of when things, you know, he had some really ornamental uh, stuff uh, in some of the later uh, 40s books. You can see down here, just in pencil, page 59. So where that was intended to go in that particular edition of the textbook. Any other things you, oh, I'd like this one to show you a range of, of scripts. Yeah, personality script is in there too. 
the one in the middle is pretty impressive. Jazzy styles. Yeah, that's the atomizing or the or the dot, the white dots I was talking about, the texture. So, yeah, and if you know, even the higher resolution, we'd be able to see that those I think are individual. I mean, I, I unless he used like a stencil or something, I think he added those individually. I love the caterpillar and radio too. <laughs> so <laughs> great. Yeah. Uh, there's I, a the the one large one that's in color here. Um, the yeah the mountains there's there's so much of this stuff but this is a particularly large and exciting uh kind of display piece seems like in in store display piece in a lot of ways um but you can see a bunch of this illustration work in the show card uh or the speedball textbooks too a lot of real similar illustrations to this yeah, this is 59 by 62 centimeters. So anybody wants to convert that to inches for me? It's a large one. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> What's that, about 20 inches, 59 centimeters? Yeah. So I can just uh, click around, but are there any questions from the... Well, I, I've got one because, I mean, this is... I mean, literally awesome, you know, see, seeing those pictures of, of the studio and, and people at work from the, you know, the early 1900s is just, it's just brilliant stuff. And um, I suppose the main question is, this obviously lives online, it lives in the archive, but are there any plans to to do a book or, you know, some kind of retrospective or I, I don't know, it just feels like the, the richness of this material is worthy of of a book. Um, I, the only thing I'm authorized to say is stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> no. I no, would encourage no. anyone to subscribe to our uh, newsletter where you can, you know, when stuff gets announced, then, um, then you'll know. Yeah. First. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm definitely on there and, uh, I'll be all over that if, and if, and when, uh, something happens. And, uh, what about just at a practical level? I mean, you know, obviously the majority of people here are, are an international audience and would, uh, primarily access the online archive, but for those in and around the Bay area or who are traveling to San Francisco, what's the, you know, practically the process for arranging to come and have a, a flick through some of this material? Yeah, so we're we're open to uh, research visits by appointment. So you can come to this page, this visit page, and conduct research. This link down at the bottom, but I'll set, put the uh, direct link in the chat. And we have you know several slots uh, every Tuesday and Wednesday where you can make a request for uh, whatever you're interested in seeing, and um, you know spend a couple of hours uh, just yourself and. Uh, and a table of objects. And again, our whole mission is to make this material as accessible as we can. So, you know, we just, you have, we have you wash your hands and you're able to touch everything that we uh, have available after a little bit of, uh, you know, menial training on, on keeping things safe. But um, yeah, that's why we exist is, is to uh, give you hands-on access and uh, we love visitors, you know, let me know if you're, you, you know, you came after hearing about this event, because I've always loved to, to meet folks who are into this stuff, especially. And we also kind of uh, try to staff those research visits kind of specifically to people that know about that information at the archive. So, uh, for instance, Stu does a lot of these uh, for Ross George people, he might be the um person to contact or the person that would help you with that. And uh, I work there doing research visits for the graffiti specific stuff because that's part of my job there. So um, yeah, there's usually a librarian who is uh, pretty well versed in that work that can talk to you about that stuff. Well, um, what you might see if you want to see the graffiti stuff. Is is this okay? Is this and this is stuff that's in the um, subscription to Mischief show? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, and a lot of other magazines, mostly magazines uh, from that time, because that's what we're focusing to collect on uh, at Letter from Archive uh, 
as sort of the most direct um, documentation of these different scenes of graffiti written and, and put together by people who were actually painting at the time. Well, I think um, everybody is uh, is awestruck, <laughs> <laughs> and um, but uh, including myself, uh, just to say um, a massive thank you to um, uh, to Stephen and Kel and um, uh, sorry to Stuart and Kel and um, to wait a minute, you're Stephen Coles, but you're Stuf. I just realised why <laughs> I made that mistake there. Yeah. Come on, yeah. what's the story there? Not easy is it to get it straight. It's just no, it's just a childhood nickname that every every uh time I change jobs I try to go to Steven and it never sticks. So call me the person. Okay, well I, I, I know you as Steven, even though I've I've obviously somehow internalized Stu as well. Um well no, thanks Stephen. Um and uh thanks Kel. Absolutely fascinating.